as we've already seen, the end of fighting in World War I, or I guess we have the end of fighting in World War I at the end of 1918. And so in 1919, it's time to talk about the terms for peace. And this happens at the Paris Peace Conference. And at this conference, you have all the parties of all the major warring parties. But the, the terms of peace are dictated by the winners. And the major powers among the winners are led by these gentlemen right over here. This is Prime Minister Lloyd George of the UK, Vittorio Orlando of Italy, George Clemenceau of France, President Woodrow Wilson of the United States. And they come to the Paris Peace Conference with very different outlooks of what the peace should look like. We already learned about President Wilson's 14 points. It was very idealistic. It talked about making the world safe for democracy, how people should uh, determine their own fate, how we should have the self-determination, the end of empires, free trade, uh, creating a league of nations so that you can avoid things like World War I again. The European side was not quite as idealistic, especially the French. As you can imagine, the French, the U.S. lost a lot of soldiers in World War I, but the French lost a significant fraction of their adult males in World War I. The ugly Western Front was fought in their country, so they were much more eager to make Germany pay for what, for what it's done. And so the terms of the treaty with Germany, the Treaty of Versailles, and the Treaty of Versailles, it's important to note, is only one of of several treaties that came out of the Paris Peace Conference, it tends to get the most attention because it was the treaty with Germany, Treaty of Versailles, and many people blame it for being part of the cause for World War II. It so humiliated Germany that it was so unacceptable that it allowed a character like Hitler to come along and, and lead Germany back into war. But the Treaty of Versailles was the treaty with Germany. You have other treaties with the Austrians, and then on, and now since the Austro-Hungarian Empire is being broken up, the Hungarians, the Ottomans, so on and so forth. But the Treaty of Versailles did several things. First, and this was kind of in line with especially the French thinking, is it assigned the guilt to Germany. So war guilt, war guilt, war guilt for Germany. And depending on where you view, you could view this as a fairly strong thing. The argument for saying Germany is responsible for the war is in, in, in late July, early August of, of 1914, it didn't take much for Germany to declare war on Russia, then on France, and then invade Belgium. I mean, this was literally a matter of days. It was pretty clear that Germany was already mobilized to do this. It was eager to do this. And it did do this without much, of a, much provocation. At that point, it was really just based on Russian mobilization. Now, those who, who would argue that this was a little strong would say, hey, hey, look, look, Germany definitely played a role in the war and maybe escalating the war, but it didn't start the war. You have the assassination of the Archduke of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austro-Hungary, and it was it was supported by or by elements in Serbia. Then you have the Austro-Hungarians who put out these very hard these these very hard terms to the Serbians, bring these people to justice immediately, otherwise we're declaring war. It seemed like they wanted to declare war. They do declare war in July of 1914. Then the Russians, they don't let that just be a little regional conflict. The Russians decide to start mobilizing, given, giving the, Germ the Germans kind of the, the, the pretext to justify their invasions, to kind of trigger this blank check that they've given the Austro-Hungarians. So there's a lot of blame that could go around, but the Treaty of Versailles places it with Germany. And then this justifies the rationale to make Germany pay for the war. So this leads to reparations, reparations for Germany, which essentially is like, look, Germany, you now have to pay the Allied powers for all of their lost, especially their, their, their losses to the economy due to the fact that you, you are guilty of, of, of starting of, of this war guilt. And the reparations were not just in paper currency. The rep reparations were in, in gold, in resources. And so it was, a very, it was a very tangible reparations. Now, it's an interesting question because these reparations are often referred to when people talk to these, these were disabling reparations. They brought the German economy down. And, and it is an open question. They were large. In, in modern dollars, the estimates I've seen is that they were approximately $400, $400 billion in 2013 money. Now, that is a very, very large number, but it's not a huge number for a reasonably sized economy like Germany, although the economy was in bad shape at the end of World War I. But it wasn't, it was, this by itself, it's not clear whether it by itself would have debilitated the economy. More likely, or, or if, you, if you were to think this is a cause, it's more the humiliation of it, that the generations of Germans, many of whom 10, 20, 30 years in the future, had nothing to do with World War I, would be con 
continuing to pay reparations to the Allies. So there's a question of its impact on the economy, and there's just the faction, the, the, the question of how, how humiliating, how humiliating it was. And as we go, it, it only the reparations only last for about 10 years, and Germany pays the equivalent of about $60 billion in modern terms, $60 billion in 2013 dollars. That's the equivalent of about $5 billion in kind of 1920 money. But on top of the reparations, the Allies were not interested in fighting another war with Germany, although ironically, by having very harsh terms of the treaty, they might have triggered the next war in World War II, the rise of Hitler. And since they didn't want to have another war with Germany, they essentially limited the German army to 100,000 men, which is a very small army. As we've seen in many of the, the battles, you had battles with four or 500,000 men. So this is pretty much, this is pretty much almost just like a, like a police force. It's, it's not really an army. And they weren't allowed any longer to have submarines, U-boats, uh, 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 kind of any kind of heavy mili military equipment, artillery, heavy artillery, uh, military airplanes, uh, 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 battleships of any kind. So it was really just a, a scaffold of an army so that they, they so that you, there, so that there wouldn't be another, or they hoped there would not be another German invasion. And then on top of that, Germany was stripped of territory, territory, and some of that was directly in Germany. Poland was carved out. Poland was carved out out of part of part of the German Empire. So this is the new Poland that's carved out out of the Paris Peace Conference. So you see right over here, it kind of cuts Germany into two pieces. East Prussia is still part of Germany, but it's all by itself right out here. So per Poland is cut out. Germany loses Alsace and Lorraine, which it captured in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War. Mineral-rich region, region, the French have been eager to get it back. The Germans, actually, that was one of their, an arguable justification why they wanted to preemptively attack France, because they knew that France was eager to capture it back at some point in the future. But on top of that, Germany lost its colonies. And Germany was not as, and nowhere near as big of an empire as, say, the British or even the French. It was actually a fairly new country formed in, in, the, in 1871. But it did have an empire. It had colonies in southwest Africa. Maybe that's the darker color. Southwest, actually, throughout Africa. Throughout Africa. It had colonies in the Pacific. It even had a colony, it even had a colony in China. And all of that was then given over to given over to the Allies. So the big idea from the Treaty of Versailles is that it was most historians would say it was it was really kind of sticking it to the Germans. The Germans felt it was humiliating, and one could argue that it did help lead to some of the extremism that we'll see in the next few decades of Germany. Now the one win that Woodrow Wilson was able to get out of the Treaty of Versailles is it did set up the League of Nations. The League League of Nations. Now, the irony here is that the U.S. does not ratify the Treaty of Versailles because it's suspicious of these kind of extra national organizations. It actually wasn't happy with some of the territorial distribution that it was just giving it from one empire to another as opposed to kind of having self-determination. So the U.S. was not actually a, a signatory. It, it did not actually sign the treaty. It did not ratify the Treaty of Versailles. But re regardless of that, the Treaty of Versailles had a huge impact in kind of sticking it to sticking it to the Germans. Now, on top of that, the Paris Peace Conference, as we've already said, had various treaties with the other central powers. And some of the, and I'm not going to go into detail on what happened, especially in the Ottoman Empire. That's, I think, worth another video. But the big, the big effect on the Austro-Hungarian Empire is it was essentially not an empire anymore. It was split up into various countries. Austria was set up as a separate country. And actually, and actually, the Treaty of Versailles, in the Treaty of Versailles, Germany is, is, is forbidden from in any way merging with Austria, German, a German-speaking country. You have, Austria, you have Hungary becoming, becoming a separate state. You have a new state of Czechoslovakia. You have, you have a new state of Yugoslavia. Some of your, all of a sudden, your, the, 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 kind of the, the trigger of World War I, the desire of having this unified southern Slavic state is now becoming a reality. Bosnia and uh, you have Bosnia and Serbia and Croatia and Slovenia are taken out of, out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So you have a major redrawing of the map of Europe. These, some of these new nations here in, in Eastern Europe are out of the old Russian Empire. They were able to declare their independence. Some of it short-lived before kind of becoming satellite states or becoming part of the USSR, but they had their short-lived independence 
as after the fall of the Russian Empire. So the map of Europe is dramatically changed due to the Paris Peace Conference, the Treaty of Versailles, the fall of the Russian Empire, and the other treaties that were outcomes of, outcomes of World War I.